Welcome to Canada Files. I'm Valerie Pringle. My guest today is Wes Hall, who is a highly successful business leader and entrepreneur who grew up in abject poverty in Jamaica, raised by his grandmother, and ended up founding a number of companies in Canada, which he documents in his book, No Bootstraps When You're Barefoot. He is also the founder of the Black North Initiative to combat anti-black racism in corporate Canada. Hi, Wes. Hey, Valerie, how you doing? I'm good. You start your book, obviously, in a very dramatic fashion. <laughs> you're in a, like a shack, you're a toddler. You have a four-year-old brother and a baby sister and your mom has abandoned you. You're crying and a guy on a bicycle hears you and stops to try and help you. Yeah, he came in, uh, you know, listen, I was 18 months old, so I don't really know the story, but my sister tells the story really, really well. My four-year-old, my, at the time she was four, and uh, she said that, um, you know, my mom boiled some porridge, left it on the stove and told her, when the kids are hungry, feed them. And so she fed us, the porridge was gone, we're hungry, we're crying. And so this guy was going by on his bicycle, heard the cries and came in and looked. It was like a one bedroom shack and he walked on his threshold to look inside and he saw these three kids. And my, uh, he asked my sister, what's wrong? Well. The porridge is done, she said, and my, our mom is gone, and the kids are hungry. And uh, he realized what went on, immediately went to the plantation. My grandmother was working on the plantation at the time. Went to the plantation, told my grandmother, hey, your grandkids are abandoned. Go get them. And that's it. And she was already looking after, what, a bunch of your siblings? Yeah, she had seven of, uh, uh, seven of my siblings. And three of your cousins. Uh, yep. And her own special needs daughter. Yes. And she took you in. She, without hesitation, she didn't even blink. She just got a trolley. She went to get us, loaded us up on the trolley, brought us to her shack. She had a two bedroom shack that she was raising all those uh, grandkids in. And um, you have to imagine, right? You're on a plantation, you're working. And then somebody came and said, there are three kids of your uh, of your your kids abandon and she had to leave she had to go to her supervisor probably and say hey I gotta go and she got us now what would she what's she gonna do the next day because she has to go to work and we're not school aged so she literally had to bring us to work with her the next day and the days thereafter but she was your hero giant a giant Julia Julia Vassell, and uh, I never remember a day when she was resentful of her life. And why did God do this to me? Why did I have delinquent children? She never, ever said that. And so that's what I remember. My entire life goes back to those moments of kindness that she showed to me. And, uh, and I go, I want to be that person who no matter what life throws at you, just don't be bitter. Just take it with grace. And uh, that's how I try to live my life today. Well, I mean, it does sound like your childhood, you were being looked after, you were being loved. This was, this was a great environment, yeah. although tough and poor. But the sad part of the story continued in that your mom decided she wanted you back and she came and took you. And she was, she was a really troubled, if that's the kindest yeah. description, woman. Your time with her was awful, abusive. Yeah, so the first 11 years of my life was with my grandmother. So I've experienced, you know, real parenting, selfless parenting, and uh, yes, extreme poverty. But my mom showed up at 11 and she said, okay, she pointed all the kids and she'd go, Wes is coming with me. I thought I won the lottery, but it was a tough, tough, <laughs> three years of my life uh, living with her. Physically abusive, emotionally yeah. abusive. You name it. She didn't love you? No, and she told me that specifically. She told me so many times that you're not my child and uh, you know, uh, she just called me all kinds of names in the book. She was troubled, you know, she was troubled, you know. In these days we would have, you know, we would diagnose the problem that she had, right? And uh, it could have been, uh, you know, mental illness that she had. Uh, when she left us, it could have been postpartum uh, depression that she had. 
But at that time, we just label people like those as cruel. And they may not have been. It could have been just uh, the situation that they were going through in life. But the end result was you were traumatized by her mm -hmm. and ended up leaving it age 13 to live on yeah, your own, be on your own. She threw me out, yeah, at, at, at age 13 after so much, uh, so many years of beating and abusive uh, speech and she finally realized that it wasn't hurting me anymore. Like it had no impact on me anymore. When she realized that the physical punishment and the verbal punishment had no impact on me, she realized that she lost her power and she literally packed my bags and threw me out of the house and go, you're on your own now, you're a man. And uh, that was it. I picked up this bag, it was a straw bag with my world of belongings in it. And it was a graveled uh, road. I just walked up the street and I go, this is where my life begins. And I was the happiest man when that happened. 13 years old 13, though. 13, yeah. And you said you started you know, learning how to solve problems, problem solving. <laughs> Very early. Early on, where am I gonna sleep? What yes, am I gonna eat? That's right. And you have to appreciate uh, back then, it's not like I could go on my iPhone and you know, message a friend or two or three or send an email, you know, we didn't even have pay phones booth in that neighborhood. We had nothing. Your dad, uh, when you were 16, sent for you. It was time for you to get, he thought, what, an education and become a man. Yeah, my dad was, um, you know, God bless him, because a lot of Jamaican fathers at that age, you got to keep in mind, he was 25 years old. They have kids in Jamaica with different uh, women. And that's it, their life back then is gone. The kids, they don't write the kids, they don't, uh, they have nothing to do with the kids anymore. And they leave to come to Canada or the United States or Britain, and they have a new life, and that's their life. My dad wasn't one of those persons. My dad knew that he had a responsibility, and he sent for me to come to Canada. And you have to appreciate that the time he did this was a time when a lot of these kids were coming from Jamaica to Canada and they were getting into trouble, in and out of jail. And my dad, and they were telling my dad, do not bring your boy, especially boys, do not bring your boy to Canada, he's gonna embarrass you. So I remember when I came here, my dad sat me down and gave me the speech. And the speech was, my last name is Hall. I do not want you to mess with that name. That name means a lot to me. And I don't want you to ruin it. I don't want you ever get into trouble and specifically, I never want you to go to jail. Don't ever go to jail. So could you imagine that? <laughs> the only thing my dad asked of me in life was, don't go to jail. That was it. That was the standard. That was the bar. The bar was so low that I could trip over it. <laughs> and so I figured, okay, I think I can live up to that standard. And, uh, and I did. Now, your dad was strict. Didn't want you to go to jail, but he, you know, you didn't eventually love his rules a whole lot, so you left and, you know, started doing a lot of really crummy jobs. But you said there's nothing like awful jobs, which is true, to really motivate you. What, security guard, briefly in a chicken factory, like awful. You got to keep in mind that from 13 to 16 in Jamaica, I was my own man. I was going to school, paying my own bills, work in. I was an adult, 13 to 16. And then 16, I became a child again under my dad's roof. And I just could not tolerate it. I was never the kid who was gonna go to jail. I knew that because I didn't when I was in Jamaica. And I had plenty of opportunities to do that, but I didn't. So I wasn't gonna mess it up coming to Canada, but he didn't know that. And so at 18, I go, I gotta be out. And I packed my bag, didn't tell my dad, I left. And uh, then I started, okay, I need to work. I worked at a chicken factory. It was the worst job ever, okay? So if your kid has trouble kind of figuring out what they should do in life, yeah, they need to get a really, really bad job. It wakes you up. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like cold water in your face when you get up first thing in the morning, okay? There's nothing that brings you back to reality, like something that you sit there and go, I am going to be doing this for eight hours a day with two 15 minute breaks and a 30 minute lunch for 30 years. This is it. 
And then you go, no, no, there's got to be something better. And so I was able to explore what that better looks like. <laughs> and that better just led me to where I'm at today. Well, it starts, which is great, in the mailroom of a you know, fancy law firm. And you show up, I love this story. You, you go to Goodwill you know, to buy a used suit and tie, but you show up in that mailroom in a suit and tie because this is not your destination. Well, you know, Valerie, the funny thing is I grew up, when I came to Canada, I was in Malvern in Scarborough. Malvern is a very underserved community in Toronto. So when I got the opportunity to interview and get this for this mailroom position on Bay Street, I didn't know what Bay Street was. When I got into the elevator, it came, I came off on the 13th floor, my ear popped because I didn't, I've never been in an elevator that high before, ever, ever. And then I walked out and it was like I was in an episode of LA Law. <laughs> it was so beautiful, all these art on the wall and expansive views and I sat there and I go, wow, this is a different life. And then I saw lawyers walking around, but when I went to the job interview, I was still a security guard. So I was wearing my security guard uniform. <laughs> I didn't even know that I, I probably should get dressed up because I didn't know where I was going. I figured I was just going for a job in a mailroom. And then I saw these lawyers dressed up and fancy. I go, wow, I got the job. Start Monday, I went to Goodwill, got myself a suit because I got to look like those guys that I saw walking around. And I showed up in the mailroom with a suit on and these guys in the mailroom looking at me, puzzled. They were wearing jeans and t-shirt. And I go, why are you wearing a suit? They go, I said, because everybody else is wearing suits. They're like, people are going to think you're a lawyer. I'm like, oh, maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe that's not a bad thing. And I kept wearing a suit. Ever since then, I'm wearing a suit on Bay Street. You, you know, the story continues, and it's a great story. But you moved up the ladder, various jobs, and then ended up, you know, in your 30s, founding your own company, Kingsdale, which was a big risk. Well, it was huge. Um, and a huge success. Yeah. So that was like um, specializing in proxy solicitation and yeah. rode a wave of shareholder activism. Yeah. Worked super hard and, you know, dominated. Yeah, you know, Valerie, I was 34 when I started the firm. You know, got these jobs along the way and I start to watch the market because one of the things that I, I'm very curious, I'm a very, very curious person. You put me in a room to try to figure something out and it may take me forever, but I'll figure it out. Uh, so I go, this activism thing is happening in the States. And activism is uh, shareholder activism. It's now an asset class. You have activist hedge funds that are set up that are, that are worth billions of dollars today. What's their job? They look at companies that are on the, the, the stock market that's undervalued because they have poor management. They get rid of the management team, put their own team in place, and they turn the company around. Well, they need to have somebody to advise them and to help them to do that. So I go, I'm going to be the guy in Canada. When it comes to Canada, I didn't say if, when it comes to Canada, I want to be the guy to lead that charge and either defend companies or help activists get rid of management and companies. And everybody thought I was nuts. It'll never happen in Canada. We'll never have activism. Nobody, we're too cordial. <laughs> everybody loves each other. It's a kumbaya <laughs> nation. That will never happen. I go, it will happen. I went to every single bank to get financed and every single one of them went thumbs down. I went to all investors that I knew, thumbs down. And I went home to my wife and I said, can we mortgage the house? And she gave me the thumbs up. It was not easy, by the way, but I had to convince. I had to get a business plan together to convince her. She gave me the thumbs up. We took $100,000 against my mortgage, against the house. And I started Kingsdale Advisors. And to this day, we're the number one brand in the country. Now, it's interesting, Wes, because, you know, your brothers, two of them, you know, are examples of sad stories, didn't make it. One ended up deported, um, one ended up dead. Uh, how do you sort of understand that story? My brothers came to this country and they saw something very different than I saw. I saw opportunity, but I saw that you had to work to get that opportunity. My brothers felt it was going to be a lot easier for them. So they went into drugs, went into gangs. And uh, one of my brother was, uh, my younger brother at the time, he was exactly the same age when I came. He was 16 years old. And he uh, got, uh, was in and out of jail until he finally got deported. And my other brother, um, I was at work 
and I got a phone call from uh, the Buffalo Police Station that we found a body and he has an identification on it and we found your name in a book that he had and uh, we want to know if you're related to this person. Again, we didn't have the same last name. I drove to Buffalo and identify uh, the body it was my brother. He was uh, beaten and thrown in a dumpster and that's how he died. And so to me, it was, um, it was sad because I had to call my grandmother uh, to let my grandmother know it was the saddest call that I had to make because uh, she, you know, she was, she was broken up, right? The, and so to me, it was, I can't stop giving people a break because of, of what happened. I have to keep trying because somebody is going to break that, that, you know, that, that, you know, that, that path of just violence and poverty. Somebody's going to break it. I did. And I just know that uh, other people in my family would eventually do that as well. It was interesting that you thought maybe poverty was the greatest barrier you had to face. And you, you, you write that, you know, I was mercifully blind to the systemic barriers thrown in my path because I was raised in a place that didn't have them. You grew up in Jamaica, doctors, lawyers, teachers, everybody, prime minister, is black. Then you come to a country that's different and you wake up. You know, sometimes they call this Canadian racism polite racism. You know, when did you become aware of it? I was blind to it for a lot of my career, but it's not because I was naive. It's because of the fact that I just go, it's gotta be something else. It can't be because I'm black. It's gotta be something else. Maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe I didn't dress right. And that's why from the moment I came on Bay Street, I go, I gotta start looking like everybody else. I can't look different. So when I start looking like everybody else, I'm starting to treat a little bit differently. I'm like, oh, maybe there's a reason. And then of course, later on, you look back and you go, wow, I experienced a lot of racism. And thank God I, was, uh, I didn't let it stop me because today it stops so many people. Tell me what you thought when you saw the murder of George Floyd. Um, I was in my office, uh, home office, because we're in, on lockdown. Somebody sent me a note and said, have you seen the video? And I said, yes, I have, because I thought it was the Ahmaud Aubrey video when he was jogging through the neighborhood and he, was, uh, and he was killed. And I said, no, no, there's one that's more egregious than that, the George Floyd video. I go, okay, sent me the link, I looked at it. I stood up, after looking at it, I stood up and there's a mirror in front of my desk at home. And I literally looked in the mirror and I saw George Floyd. It, it broke my heart. It literally broke my heart and it mentally affected me. What I was experiencing, there's a psychological term for it, it's called linked fate. That means that if you saw somebody in your ethnic group experiencing trauma, that it's like you personally experiencing that trauma. And so that's what the black community was going through at the time. That's what I was going through at the time. And I go, I have to do something about it. I have to say something. And I have to talk about my experience as a black person. Because as you mentioned, in Canada, we just go, there's no racism here. Oh, we're, we're the land of milk and honey. Everybody's treated the same way. Not if you're living it, not if you experience it. And so I start talking about my lived experience. And by the way... Being pulled over, being stopped. Yeah, you name it. And so I, I say to folks, you know the people, black people that experience the most racism are the wealthy black people because they're always in places that they don't belong. They don't see people like them there. So I talk about driving my fancy Ferrari to the Four Seasons and getting out and somebody handing me $20 to valet their car for them. I dress like this. Or I talk about going to the airport on a business trip and I'm in a priority line and before I handed my boarding pass, someone's like, oh, you're in the wrong line. You should be in the, in, the, um, in the back of the plane. You should be over there in the economy line. Or I talk about people coming to my house to work on my house and go, go get Mr. Hall for me. Or I'm jogging through my neighborhood with my wife and they would stop my wife and say, could I use your personal trainer one day? Those are things where people go, well, is that racism? Well, yes. you tell me. Yes. <laughs> you tell me. Tell me, after George Floyd, and you said your conscience dictated you had to act, um, you started Black North Initiative. What's the goal 
what was the goal? The goal is, it, it, first of all, it's a very lofty goal. The goal is that um, we can do better as Canadians, right? And, and, and I want to use business leaders to solve this problem and view it as a business problem. For example, business leaders look for talent. Talent takes your business to the next level. Do you discriminate against talent? If you know, for example, if you hire West Hall, you're going to win versus if you hire somebody else that doesn't look like West Hall, you're going to lose. Who are you going to hire? West Hall. The reason why Kingsdale became the number one firm and, and built the reputation that we've built was because I'm a winner. And it didn't matter that I'm a black winner. I'm a winner and people hire winners. So I say to these corporate leaders, find the winners, but make sure that when you're looking at the winning pool, the pool of winners, that it's inclusive. That you're not just looking at white winners, you're looking at winners of color, you're looking at winners that are women, you're looking at winners that are black, and then you go, let me build my organization among winners that are diverse, that's diverse. And if we start with a diverse group of people, we don't have to worry about ultimately, we need a black person here, we need a woman here. We just hire people after that. The reason why we have to now break it down to go, I need a black person, is because they don't exist in our organization. And now we wanna create diversity. So we need to go out and find those people to create that diversity. And eventually once we solve that problem, we don't have to worry about DEI. Are you worried about a DEI backlash? No, because there is a movement in particular in the United States to completely discredit the movement. It's, um, it's strategic, uh, it's political. People who are intentional don't look for excuses to be intentional. They look at it and go, it's the right thing to do. And nobody can tell me that not having a diverse team is bad. How is Black North doing? Black North is doing amazing. I'm, you know, I'm humbled by it, first of all, and the reason why I'm humbled is because I was able to identify over 500 CEOs in this country that have said, I'm gonna do something about it. And they signed a pledge to do something about it. That humbled me. And when we see the outcome so far, it's just absolutely amazing what we've, got, what we've accomplished in just three years. You say, um, what made me? My grandmother's example, my mother's abuse, surviving on my own, and my faith. They taught me to always get back up. Yeah. It's, uh, it's amazing because people go, what would you change in your life? Well, I probably wouldn't have been here if, I ch if I'd changed anything. If my mother didn't abandon me, it wouldn't have led me to this incredible woman, my grandmother, who instilled such you know, industriousness, you know, such humility in me and such selflessness. It wouldn't have led me to her. Uh, if my dad didn't leave Jamaica for a better life, it wouldn't uh, instill the just go get it and figure it out kind of attitude which he had to do when he came to this country. So, and my faith, quite frankly, it just keeps me humble. You know, uh, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. Could you imagine uh, you know, working on a billion dollar deal one day and then I go to my place of worship and it's my turn to clean the toilet because we don't hire people to do that. It's the people in the congregation that had to do that. And somebody says, Wes, it's, you got to go clean the toilet, the men's toilet. And I'm there with an apron cleaning the men's toilet. And the next day I'm working on the CP rail multi-billion dollar transaction. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps you humble. And uh, when you're knocking on strangers' doors, and they look at you and say, get lost, because they don't, they're not interested in your message. It also keeps you humble. But it also gives you a servant mentality, that you're here to serve others, not yourself, to serve others. And so that's what I appreciate about the life that I have. If I didn't have any of those pieces, I probably would have been a different person today. What does being Canadian mean to you? You know, it's, it means that, uh, we're different. It means that we're welcoming. It means that uh, you know we care for other people. It means that we're an example to the world. And when we travel 
and we have that Canadian flag on our backpack or our arm and people see that it means something to them historically and we as Canadians have to fight hard to make sure that we keep that identity that when people look to us they go that's a beacon of light that's where I want to be in life and uh, and 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 unfortunately as a nation we're losing that and we have to fight hard to reclaim it well it's a pleasure spending time with you Wes Hall thank you Valerie thanks for having me thank you and we'll be back next week uh, with more Canada Files The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of Mary Davy, as well as the following donors Ted and Alice Kernahan, Tony and Sherry Fell, Michael McCain and family, the Browning Watt Foundation, David and Cheryl Carr, Bryce and Nikki Douglas, Richard Wernham and Julia West, Earl and Janice Oborn, the Linwood Family Foundation, Steve and Catherine Coxford, Richard Pilosoff, Clinch House Foundation, the 63 Foundation, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.